So the creators of the original artificial neural networks drew their inspiration from biology. But as the artificial neural networks matured, uh, they relied on biological facts less and less. And the modern artificial neural networks, such as the ones used in deep learning, successful as they may be, resemble biological neural networks only superficially, violating even the basic biological constraints. So this wide gap between artificial and natural neural networks raises important questions. What is the algorithm that underlies biological neural computation? And if we can answer this question, maybe biological insights can help us improve artificial neural networks to make them more powerful, more energy efficient, and more human-like. So what are these biological constraints that um, we have to think about when coming up with um, biological algorithmic foundation for biological neural networks? So for biologists in the audience, um, this is maybe natural, even though that some words may look a little unfamiliar, um, but for computer scientists, um, I think it's important to have this list in mind. Um, biological neural networks operate in the online setting. I'll say a couple more words what it is. Uh, learning rules have to be local in physical space. Um, neural activity is non negative and sparse, and neurons are subdivided into excitatory and inhibitory. So, this kind of uh, constraints are crucial to respect if you want to build a model of the brain computation and biological brain. Uh, but for computer scientists, some of those constraints may seem like roadblocks because they basically negate some of the successful algorithms that are used at the moment. Um, but when we so that's how we thought also when we started this work. But over a few years after developing this direction, we started to realize that these constraints are not really roadblocks, but they're more like guardrails in the sense that they direct the development of neural networks. And they help us to come up with better algorithms. And I'll try to um, demonstrate this in this talk. Uh, one more, um, not a constraint, but uh, we will focus in this talk on unsupervised learning. And um, of course, you know, we know that humans are capable of supervised learning, um, but large labeled data sets are not common in biology. And anyone who observes how, observed how kids learn know that supervision is highly overrated. Okay, so here's one more data point that I can put on the plot. Okay, so what, we, what I will try to do today is um, to try to show you how we can construct such an algorithmic network, a framework that respects this biological constraints. And we will use, uh, what I mean by an algorithmic theory is something akin to a normative approach as it's called in neuroscience, where we follow the same kind of framework that is of course used in physics, um, but also in machine learning where you start with formulating um, your model in terms of an optimization problem, and then you derive an online algorithm that solves this problem, and then we hope to identify the steps of that online algorithm with physiology in the neuronal networks in the actual brain. So that's the plan. Now, in this framework, um, it's supposed to be kind of a mechanistic um, thing that, you know, once developed, you have a cost function of Hamiltonian, and you can turn the crank, and you get the algorithm of the neural network. But the big question is, what optimization problem is the brain solving? Um, and, of course, we have no other choice but to guess. But actually, thinking back at how physics developed, you know, three, four hundred years ago, that was the same process. Right? So it's perfectly okay to try to guess 
the objective function. And uh, what I will do, <clears throat> I will first discuss the conventional approach, which I call the reconstruction approach, um, to formulating this objective function. And it has been somewhat successful, but it runs into major problems. And so motivated by that, we developed a novel approach we call similarity matching, and I will explain what that is. So to get us started, I want to show some experimental data. Um, of course, you've seen a lot of such videos now if you uh, were at Mriganka's talk. Uh, so this is uh, a video of the activity of neurons in the brain of a live behaving animal that is running on a treadmill and is also in virtual reality, so it's shown visual stimuli. And this is recordings of neurons in the visual cortex. So as I let the video run, you can see that these blobs corresponding to the um, individual neurons light up and down. Um, and different patterns light up at different time points because the animal is shown different visual stimuli. So I also have a shameless plug for the software that uh, was developed in my group to automatically extract um, time traces of activity of those individual neurons from the videos. This has been a major bottleneck in experimental laboratories uh, because previously the neurons were delineated manually and it took more time to analyze this data than actually to do the experiments. Now we have a package that in most cases allows extraction of those activity traces automatically. One thing to keep in mind is because what is being imaged here is calcium concentration in the neurons, the spikes are actually low pass filtered. And so there needs to be an additional step to deconvolve the actual spike points from those low pass filtered uh, transients. And so the spikes are indicated here by asterisks. Um, there are two points that I want you to remember from this diagram is that the neuronal activity is sparse at any given time when a small fraction of neurons is active and um, neuronal activity at least um, uh, you know whatever, whichever way you characterize it doesn't change sign so we will take it as non-negative uh, you, you mean in the brain or in the Here. software Here. oh uh, in the software yeah so software automatically solves the factorization problem by decomposing the video, if you put it into a big matrix, into the temporal and spatial components, sort of like singular value decomposition. So it finds the optimal spatial profile for each neuron and plots a corresponding time trend. Um, so if I showed you a raw video, it would be jumping like this because of the motion in the brain. But after you run the motion correction, the location of the neuron in this frame will remain constant. The extraction of spikes is not a very reliable process. Yeah, no, I, I agree, okay, and, and usually there is no ground truth um, to benchmark it, so you can do it for one neuron because you can patch one neuron and do calcium imaging at the same time, but then whatever kernel you extract from there will not apply to other neurons because experimentalists in some cases like to see spikes. But depending on your question, you may be able to answer just from the calcium transients. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, depending on your question. And for the purposes of this talk, talk I will characterize neuronal activity just with the firing rate. So even, even simpler than that. So just the number of spikes per second, okay? Any other questions? The reason I showed you this data is because I think one of the central questions in neuroscience right now is what is the right way to think about this neuronal population activity? What, what does it really represent, right? And one answer has been around for many years, and um, this is what I call the reconstruction approach, and this is a hypothesis that the activity of neurons collectively reconstructs the stimulus that is being shown to the brain. So in the visual cortex, for example, we know that neuronal feature vectors, that is stimuli that 
um, stimulate each neuron the strongest are edges uh, different orientation and um, spatial frequency so you can think of population neuronal population activity in v1 as reconstructing the stimulus in this uh, patch for example as a linear combination of those feature vectors weighted by the fine rates of individual neurons. So this is like, you know, Fourier decomposition, except that the basis is not Fourier, but it's this Gabor patches, and so it's an overcomplete basis. Okay? So in mathematical notation, um, you can write it down by reshaping the pixel intensities in this image patch into a vector x, and then it is a product of the um, neuronal activity vector where each component is a fine rate of an individual neuron multiplied by the so-called dictionary matrix W where each column is again a reshaped pixel intensities of corresponding feature vectors stacked up like this, okay? So it's just like a basis again, except that it's not orthogonal and often overcomplete. Um, so this is the central tenet of the reconstruction approach, and there have been many theories, um, generally under the name of efficient coding, that use that approach to make important predictions about biology. And some of them have been very successful, but in my opinion, perhaps the pinnacle of this approach is uh, the so-called sparse dictionary learning that was proposed by Olshausen and Field 20 years ago, where they suggested a mechanism, a biologically plausible mechanism, to, learn, to not just extract um, the neuronal activity vector, but also learn the feature dictionary. Um, their approach is based on the same sort of normative or algorithmic framework they, that I outlined, and it starts with an objective function um, that actually is very simple. Um, so the first term is the reconstruction error. This is the reconstruction approach, right? So we represent each stimulus xt as a linear combination of the dictionary times the activity vector yt squared plus this L1 norm of the activity vector, which is added to encourage sparsity of the neuronal activity, which has been observed experimentally, as we've seen. Um, but you can think of this both computationally as a, a, as a sparsity-inducing regularizer, and from the physics perspective, as an energetic cost, metabolic cost, of neural computation. No. So we optimize this with respect to y for all time points t. Ah, okay. Uh, so what I'm doing now, I'm not telling you how that algorithm to extract spikes worked. Uh, I'm trying to build a model of what the brain is computing by those neuronal activities. Okay? Um, so in this formulation, we just form, want to find an optimal W, time-independent time independent W, but this is the so-called offline setting, right? When you would uh, have the setting if you had the whole data set, all XTs, and you wanted to find all YTs and W. But the brain doesn't have access to the whole data set, right? Because stimuli, sensory stimuli are streamed by sensory organs one at a time, sequentially, right? And the brain has to compute the output to produce behavior on the fly. And that's so-called online or streaming setting, okay? So because of that, W is allowed to change as we go along. Not here, this is an offline formulation. And, for, yes, yes. Okay, here, no. It's just one W. That's right. That, that's correct. With the time-independent W.
Okay? That's right. So W will capture the correlations that are present in the data set X, in the spatial organ correlations of X. So, um, so of course, as I was saying, okay, so we have to optimize. So for each stimulus, we have to find the optimal YT by solving this optimization. And then we have to find the dictionary W, which is normalized to one, uh, that optimizes the whole cost. Okay, so, and in fact, what you will see is we now favor just the non-negativity prior, which actually produces sparse output because of the competition between components. So there are various things you can do, but this was historically the first kind of um, overcomplete dictionary learning framework. That's why I'm talking about it. Okay? Isn't this very similar to NMF? Yes, yes. It, it can be thought of as NMF. There is, in the original Oshausen and Peel framework, the sign of the uh, Y could change, but you could constrain it. And in fact, that's what we will do. Yes, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So, so what Oshausen and Peel did, they said, okay, we now want to solve this the way the brain might be solving this that is on, in the online setting. So the stimuli xt are streamed sequentially one at a time. We have to compute yt, OK? And so the way you can solve this problem is um, by uh, doing alternating minimization. So first, let's assume the w is fixed. In the offline, OK, it will be fixed. But in the online, you can take it from the previous time step, and minimize with respect to y. So if you took a derivative of this with respect to y um, and computed a gradient descent step, you would come up with expression like this. And the nonlinearity here, this soft threshold function, uh, has to be put in because of this L1 norm that has a non-differentiable point at 0, so there is a cast. And the correct way to solve this is by introducing subgradients, which essentially results in having this nonlinearity here. So if you iterate this step until convergence, you can show that you will find the optimal y. Okay. And this also is related to um, the subfield of compressive sensing that some of you might know about. Okay, but once uh, okay, but so so this was the iteration, um, but that seems like a you know a pretty difficult algorithmic step. The beauty of what Olshausen and Peel did was that this iteration can be naturally implemented by a neuronal network of this architecture. Okay, so here the input vector x t is represented by the activity of these three neurons in this example, each, uh, the fine rate of which represents the component of x. And then the first matrix vector multiplication is simply accomplished by passing that activity vector through the synaptic connectivity matrix W transpose and summing up the inputs in these neurons. The second matrix vector multiplication is accomplished the same way if the synaptic weights are encoded by the gramian of W through those lateral connections. And so, uh, and, and the nonlinearity here is the output nonlinearity of neurons, which also seems somewhat biologically except that the activity can flip sign. So if you iterate this algorithm, uh, if you want to iterate um, this uh, step, you can do this simply through the activity dynamics in this kind of network by just running it on real or artificial neurons. When the activity settles, you compute the optimal yt. Of course, there has to be a second step. Right now, we keep yt fixed. We clamp x and we clamp y, and we have to compute the optimal W, and that can be done again by a gradient descent step. If you take a derivative of this with respect to W, you get an expression like this, and 
you update the synaptic weights in all of those connections according to this rule. And this is so-called a learning rule for a neuronal network. This has been, uh, this algorithm has been extremely successful because if you run it on something like natural images, right, a collection of photographs taken in the forest or anywhere, um, in a completely unsupervised fashion, it learns this neuronal features, right? So these are now this weights of synapses converging on each neuron, reshaped again into a patch, gives this Gabor-looking edge detectors. But this is obtained in an unsupervised manner in this neuronal network on natural images, yet it resembles what has been measured physiologically in experiments in the neurons like you saw in Mriganka's talk, for example. So this unsupervised algorithm can learn the same feature vectors as neurons in the visual cortex of mammals such as monkeys or cats or yourselves. That's why the Olshausen and Field algorithm made a big splash when it was first proposed. Do you have parallel corpora with which you are able to verify this? Uh, say it again, please. Do you have parallel corpora with which you can verify this when you have electrodes sticking into the neuron? Yes, yes. So, so there has been work where people matched the distribution of spatial frequency and other statistics of the learned uh, dictionary with the ones measured physiologically with electrodes. And although the match is not perfect, there is pretty good agreement. But, but I want to point out that you're not guaranteed to get this uh, wavelets from any um, stimuli, right? So if you tried a different data set, which is not natural images, like the auditory data set that Michael proposed, you would get something else. Well, but not, not, not in the two-dimensional space, right? Not exactly like that, right? Yeah, okay. The basis is not unique, so that's, thank you for that. This is not a convex optimization problem, and so there is no guarantee that the algorithm converges to the global minimum. In practice, it always converges, and the different local minimum that you arrive to, depending on the order of presentation or initialization, are all equally good, and they all produce dictionaries of this general appearance, but of course the detailed um, form of the feature vectors differs between, um, uh, from run to run. So, but uh, this was a biological looking network that recovered those statistical features. As long as those axes come from the same universality class, like natural images for example, you will get W where individual vectors may look a little bit different and there's certain a permutation uh, degeneracy. But the general statistics of the dictionary will be the same. So to the best of my knowledge, this has been tried in the retina, but not very, um, not really fully in V1. In V1, what people try to do is to be able to classify the stimulus, so get a binary decision. But I'm not aware of the work, unless someone here may know where they actually reconstructed the image. And the main reason, I think, is that until recently, it was impossible to monitor the activity of large enough collection of neurons to reconstruct a meaningful image. And only now, with the calcium imaging techniques and the kind of um, experimental feats that Mriganka talked about, uh, you could image enough neurons to do a sensible reconstruction. Uh, more, more or less the same, because, you know, the, it's W, W transpose is not exactly an identity matrix, but it's, you know, it's a diagonal heavy. All right? Okay. So this was all the great things about the Oshausen and Field algorithm, and it did make a splash when it first appeared, but in the long run, it is much more popular in computer science than it is in neuroscience. And I think one of the reasons for that is that the learning rule that they proposed is actually not biologically plausible. Why is that? Well, 
let's look at it carefully, and this is why I left all the subscripts. So this is the weight of a synapse between neurons I and J. And, okay, the first term is just simply the product of the activities of neurons I and J, which is perfectly sensible because that synapse connects those two neurons, and so it has access to the activity of that, those two neurons. And this is, in fact, called the Hebbian learning rule, known for uh, more than half a century. But the second term is not local. What I mean by that is that depends on the activity of not just the two neurons that the synapse connects, but of all the other neurons in the system with those synapse-specific weights. And it's very difficult to imagine, based on our knowledge of biology, that this tiny little synapse sitting in the midst of your brain would have access to the activities of all the other neurons in the system. Right? There is no wireless communication in the brain. So how could it possibly not? And this is just for fit-forward connections learning rule. It is, you might notice that there was no learning rule for the lateral connections in the Olshausen and Field uh, work. Um, the lateral connections were obtained as the gramians of the fit-forward, and that's just not something that you can do biologically, right? Computer gramian of such huge matrices. So, how do we know the dependence of W on J minus K? You said all, but it depends on the... Right, right. So you could... So yeah. So, so there could be a limited range, but it's very hard to imagine that you know, a synapse would have access to any activity of any neurons other than the ones that it connects. Because, you know, just, it's not touching them, so. Okay. So this was one major problem with the uh, Olshausen and Field, but not just the Olshausen and Field, but any reconstruction approach has this kind of problem. And this is not the only problem. There are others on more conceptual nature um, that I will skip over in the interest of time, but basically this is what motivated us to search for a different approach for the algorithmic um, description of neural computation. And the approach that we developed we call similarity matching, but before I tell you exactly what it is, um, let me show you a little bit more experimental data um, to motivate what we did. And um, this is actually the kind of experimental data that existed, that was published before we did our work, but we didn't know about it. Um, and we discovered it only after we did the work. But this is a very nice result obtained by functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, in the human IT, inferred temporal cortex, which is one of the higher visual areas, like the uh, prefrontal cortex that we're going to talk about. And in that uh, cortex, if you record the activity uh, with fMRI, you cannot record activity of individual neurons. You record activity of voxels, each of which has like 10 to the 5 neurons. But you still can record an activity vector in response to a visual stimulus presentation. And so they presented 100 different visual stimuli to subjects that were lying in the scanner, recorded activity vector in response to each visual stimulus, and computed correlations or scalar products or inner products between activity vectors corresponding to each pair of the visual stimuli. Okay, So this 100 by 100 matrix, which we call the similarity matrix, uh, indicates how similar neuronal activity patterns were in the brain of those subjects in response to the pairs of those stimuli. Of course, the highest similarity is for the activity pattern um, to itself, so the diagonal is purple, but you can also see that this is block diagonal, this block diagonal structure, which happens to correspond to the cognitive categories, like animate and inanimate stimuli, suggesting that the activity patterns belonging to stimuli from the same category are more similar than the activity patterns elicited by stimuli that belong to different cognitive categories. And there is also fine structure corresponding to faces. Okay? So it seems that the brain cares about representing similarity. And this similarity matrix is 
rather invariant. If you put a different person into the fMRI scanner, you will get almost the same matrix, even though the activity patterns are, of course, completely different. Even the number of neurons differs from one brain to another, okay? But the similarity between activity patterns remains invariant. And in fact, it remains invariant not just between different individuals, homo sapiens, it is almost invariant even between different species, such as the macaque. Um, in this case, this activity um, was recorded not even by fMRI, but electrophysiology. So this is single neuron level activity vector. But the similarity you compute on the vectors elicit of activity elicited by those um, stimuli looks very similar to the one observed in humans by fMRI. So you're starting to get an idea that maybe the similarity matrix is the right language to describe brain computation. Yeah, they share something about the representation, but that invariance was not obvious when you thought about you know, individual neuronal receptive fields. It becomes obvious when you uh, compute the similarity matrix. Very good question. So if you look at the primary visual question, in response to the same stimulus set, you don't see any structure. So the similarity of neuronal activity does not reflect cognitive categories. It may reflect some other similarity on the pixel level basis, like in terms of those Gabor patches, of course, but not in terms of the um, cognitive category. So somehow the brain transforms the representation as the inform visual information is being processed from the one where similarity of the neuronal activity matches on the pixel level to the one where it matches on the cognitive level. So, um, but even before this data was published, um, there was a suggestion that the brain um, cares about representing similarities, and the Edelman published a big paper suggesting that this is the way to go. Uh, it makes sense uh, from the conceptual framework, of course, for those from machine learning, you know that kernels are useful, so that's what similarity matrix is, it's a kernel. Um, and so that makes sense. And so what we did, we decided to take that point of view one step further, to show that how the brain could actually transform the representations to go from the low level, pixel level representations to Gabor patches and to higher level features. And to illustrate what we did, um, this is um, a cartoon representing the same fMRI data set, um, just for two animate and two inanimate stimuli. And what I want you to imagine is um, to do uh, some sort of a Gedanken experiment. So imagine that this is the activity of neurons in the IT cortex, and then there is another fictional part of the brain which has to make the actual decision whether the object is animate or inanimate. You can do this with just two neurons, right? One will turn on in response to animate, and one with response to inanimate. And for something like this, you can even do it by just a linear classifier, right? But the point that I want to make is if you have two neurons that represent animate and inanimate in this binary fashion, if you plot the similarity matrix, it will just have this block diagonal structure with ones here and zeros here. And what our similarity matching proposal is that this is the na nature of transformation of similarities that the brain accomplishes. Basically, in this case, it is a simply low rank approximation to the input similarity matrix. So again, what we call the similarity matching principle is that at every stage, a neuronal network 
tries to match the similarity of the inputs by the similarity of the outputs. Mathematically, similarity are just scalar products or inner products, right? So x1 transpose x1, x1 transpose x2, and so on. And this is, um, you have t by t matrix of input similarities, and you match it by t by t matrix of output similarities, okay? So in this notation, of course, um, so sample uh, covariance would be um, the other way. It would be matrix um, which had the dimensions, the number of neurons in the input uh, and the number of neurons output. So it would have different dimensions. But this is the similarity of the kernel of the Gramian. So it would have t by t dimensions. Of course, the number of objects is large. And it is uh, daunting to even think about writing down that matrix. But fortunately, as you will see, we don't have to. Because what we have developed is an online algorithm that accomplishes this matching and thereby solves this classification or clustering problem. Are these neurons close to each other physiologically? Uh, the ones in IT? Yes, yeah, so that's a good point um, that there is topographic kind of arrangement and so, yes, neurons representing animate features could be located in one region, slightly um, concentrated in one part of IT, and the inanimate in the other part of IT. Okay. All right, so what we can do, so that's the novelty of our approach, is to suggest an online framework that would implement this matching under certain constraints. So if the number of neurons in the input and the output is different, I'm not sure how to implement that. So that is indeed the solution of this objective. And that has been known, at least without the non-negativity constraint, in multidimensional scaling. So this is the classical multidimensional scaling cost function. And the solution, as Manish just pointed out, is simply the projection to the principal subspace, which is up to a rotation identical to principal component analysis. So that is indeed the solution of this objective function. Okay, But um, we uh, did two things that are different. One is we proposed an online algorithm to do this. Because in multidimensional scaling, all the papers I've seen, they solve this in the offline set setting, where all the XTs are available at the outset, and you compute all the YTs. Here, XTs come sequentially one at a time, and you have to put YT without delay. And the second thing is we introduced the constraint that YT is no negative. Simply, in our case, it was motivated by biology. We knew that what the neurons did. But then we found out that with the non-negative constraint, this objective also has been used under the name of symmetric non-negative matrix factorization. Okay? Um, the closed form solution is exponentially hard, of course, but uh, in practice, it does work and accomplishes clustering, okay? Um, but again, what we did is novel because we did that in the online setting. So we came up with an algorithm, and it's uh, really uh, not that difficult to uh, derive, um, just uh, for mathematically minded here, um, if you expand the square, these are just products um, of two scalar products um, and sum over tau. And, um, you know, this looks scary. This is, you know, potentially um, quartic terms here. But you realize that you can simplify this by noticing that if you sum over tau first, then this product is a matrix that changes very little from time point to time point because this is just sample covariance. So at large t, okay, at large t, a large tau, um, this doesn't change much. And that allows us to have a quadratic cost function, which can be solved by linear computation. So this is like a Jacobi iteration for uh, system linear equations, where uh, Wyx is this covariance that I just talked about. It has to be divided by the diagonal terms, which come from this matrix, 
okay? And WYY is sample covariance for the outputs. And then the rectification step is necessary because it's a projection on the non-negative domain to ensure the non-negativity of Y. So it looks kind of similar to Olshausen and field, and so it can be implemented by a neural network of the same general architecture. But, and that's extremely important, the learning rules are now local. You can already kind of see this here if you identify those Ws with synaptic weights, but to make it completely explicit, I wrote down the recursions for the online algorithm, and you can see that in addition to this Hebbian term, the second term that gave us troubles before because there was a sum, doesn't have a sum, and is completely local, Hebbian learning rule, where each synapse gets updated, it's, each synaptic weight gets updated only um, as a function of the activity of the two neurons that it connects. No sum over space. No sum over space, okay? In addition to that, we got learning rule for the lateral connections as well. Before, we had to get those synaptic weights from a Gramian, which is completely biologically implausible. Now, we have a local learning rule for those as well, but because of the minus here, this is an anti hebbian rule, right? So synaptic weight is minus the correlation of activity. So, um, great, so we were able to um, derive this neuronal network that solves the similarity matching objective function, and I already alluded to the fact that we knew that this uh, accomplishes clustering because it has been shown that this mathematical form is a relaxation of a k-means objective function. But um, let me just show you that this is indeed the case. So we have our network, um, and uh, we run it on an artificially, um, on a synthetic data set uh, generated by uh, three centers, the Gaussian noise, uh, and the data was uh, presented once, so that was a single pass over the data in the order indicated by those numbers, one, two, three, four, five. We first present the stimuli from one cluster, and that's, of course, the worst case scenario. But the network, nevertheless, can cluster those uh, data points very nicely. So in response to the blue points, only one neuron is active. Of course, it doesn't matter which one, but one neuron is active and the other ones are silent. In response to the green one, the second one is active, and then the red one is active. So in this case, the output of the network, those Ys, can be thought as clustering attribution indices, which are non-zero if a given data point is attributed to a certain cluster. Okay. Uh, in most cases, the attribution is absolute or hard, so that only one cluster center um, is associated with each data point, except for this data point 13, which gets softly clustered and shared by the red and the blue clusters. But it is indeed, it does indeed make sense. It's not a bug, it's a feature, because 13 lies halfway between the two clusters. So it does make sense. And I should emphasize that in addition to being a single pass, this network is completely virgin, so it has never been shown any data before. The only parameter that I had to tweak is this regularization constant lambda, which sets how many clusters the network is going to produce, right? And um, it's, it's rather robust, but you still have to choose the value of lambda. So the network does indeed accomplish online clustering. Now, what happens if the data that you present to the network doesn't have naturally um, appearing clusters, like natural images, for example, okay? And you run it through the network, and then the network happens to learn the feature vectors that, again, this oriented Gabor's, just like in Olshausen and Field, and just like in the... Uh, mammalian visual cortex uh, from natural images in unsupervised fashion, 
but the output is now non-negative. The activity as before is sparse. Um, the big advantage here, of course, that the learning rules are completely local and therefore biologically plausible, and then you can use this network as a model of the visual cortex without too much grief. Okay, one last example I wanted to show, um, I, some of you might be familiar with this Nobel Prize winning work uh, of, uh, you know, discovery of place cells and green cells, which are the neurons in the two parts of the brain, interrhinal cortex uh, and uh, hippocampus. Uh, the receptive fields in the hippocampus are located in one uh, particular spatial location. And so what is shown here is the activity of the matrix of the place cells arranged corresponding to their receptive field centers as the animal roams around. So this is, of course, artificially generated, but you can think of a mouse running around, and then there is receptive field has this difference of Gaussian shapes, and so these are the neurons that get active depending on where the mouse is. So there is an obvious correlation in the activity of those neurons, of course, and therefore when you run that kind of input through our network, you get grid cells. So these are now receptive fields, just like the Gabor patches, for the four neurons in, the, um, in our network, computed in the output. So these neurons now respond to not to a particular single location in space, but to a grid of locations like neurons do in the interrhinal cortex. This is, of course, not the first uh, network that does that. There has been previous work. The difference is that um, you know, we derived it from the objective function, we have local learning rules. Um, the other work did not. Okay? So to, um, so I think I'm running out of time, right? Um, okay. So um, to try to wrap it up and put it all together is that uh, this is the visual pathway. And originally, you know, we talked about Gabor patches, which are receptive fields in the beginning of the pathway that uh, Hubel and Wiesel discovered and Olshausen and Field were able to derive. And we can also derive those features from the pixel level representations, okay? But eventually where we want to get is IT, where those animate and inanimate representations live. And our hypothesis is that we could, we may be able to get there, or at least most of the way there, by applying our algorithm sequentially. So first, we run the algorithm on the pixels, and we know that we get the Bohr features. But then we uh, want to pass the outputs of this layer uh, to, as inputs to the next layer. And then the next layer, we learn higher order features, and then pass its outputs to the next layer, and after attacking several such layers, we hope that the network will be able to discover in an unsupervised manner higher and higher order features, hopefully get into this cognitive categories. Of course, there is a limit to how much unsupervised framework may get you, so we will have perhaps to put um, supervision or more likely reinforcement at some point, but at least we try to get this as far as possible, okay? So I skip over the last part where basically if the biologists in the audience are offended by the fact that there is direct inhibitory connections between uh, principal neurons that are excitatory, we can solve that too. And there is a slightly more complicated network where inhibitory interneurons um, naturally arise and represent Lagrange multipliers in our objective functions which enforce optimization constraints. And so, you know, that makes me very happy because now I can understand why you have excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons, and they do different jobs. And the Lagrange formula allows us to uh, describe that. Uh, and returning back to the biological constraints that launched us in this, um, uh, in this direction, so, um, these are the constraints that we were able to respect so far. Uh, we are operating in an online and streaming setting. 
but that's actually true for most artificial neural networks as well. Uh, what's crucial is that we make sure that the learning rules in the neural networks that implement our algorithms are local, and that's not true for most artificial neural networks, particularly the deep learning backpropagation algorithms. Um, neural activity is non-negative and sparse, so that's something Sparsity comes out natural once you put non-negativity because of the competition between the features. And uh, this is the part that I skipped over, um, the respect for Dale's law in neuronal networks. And finally, I want to acknowledge the people without whom this work wouldn't be done. Uh, so the brilliant scientists in um, my group, and uh, particularly Anirvan, who's in the audience, and uh, Sreyas, who is a double E major at IIT Madras, and he was an intern with me last summer. Thank you very much.